Nkrimah Media's Policy Yamtabi Madiba. Joining me today is Head of Policy Research at the Institute of Race Relations and author Inthia Jeffrey, here to unpack her book titled Countdown to Socialism, the National Democratic Revolution in South Africa since 1994. Your book looks at the National Democratic Revolution, the ANC's policy blueprint, and its crucial role in the countdown to socialism in South Africa. Briefly explain what the ANC is referring to when it talks of the National Democratic Revolution. The NDR is a Soviet-inspired strategy which was developed in the 1950s with the idea that there were many newly independent Asian and African colonies at that time, which had predominantly capitalist economies, and the Soviet Union wanted to bring them into its own orbit. So it devised a strategy called the National Democratic Revolution to slowly move them from capitalism to socialism and ultimately to communism via a series of incremental steps. And it recognized that there might be times when you might have quite rapid progress, particularly when a communist party had been solely responsible for bringing about liberation. But when, as more often was the case, you had a a mix of parties and organizations, then you had to proceed more slowly. And particularly if, if the target population was not particularly keen on becoming socialist. And uh, the the need for a protracted strategy was particularly evident in South Africa because the political transition happened in 1994. And in 1991, three years before then, the Soviet Union had been disbanded, um, which many people thought spelt the end of socialism, and and that was it. Um, Unfortunately, the SACP and the ANC here uh, didn't take that lesson at all from uh, the effective collapse of the Soviet Union. They simply decided that socialism had been badly implemented in the Soviet Union. And so you could discount the millions of deaths, the extraordinary repression, the huge inefficiency, the great shortages of consumer and, and other goods, the suffering of the people, because that hadn't been real socialism. And in South Africa, they would instead achieve real socialism, uh, an emphasis on democratic socialism, And this would be achieved over a period of time because in that global environment, uh, there was a a sort of widespread sense of disillusionment with socialism. Um, So we've now had 30 years almost of, of NDR implementation and the global environment has also shifted a great deal, which is now much more favorable to the NDR because around the world, the memory of what socialism brought to the Soviet Union, to Mao's China, to many other countries in all 100 million deaths, has faded, whereas there's been an increasing groundswell, I I think, of agitation against capitalism and an increasing belief in socialism um, in many countries, Western democracies, particularly among the youth, who have very little knowledge or understanding of just how repressive and how destructive socialism was, Um, and therefore have no sense that real socialism is likely to be just the same as what we've experienced before. Tell us about the ANC's strategy of people's war and how it manifested in the struggle against apartheid. Well, the NDRs is the second stage of a two-stage revolution. This was Lenin's idea that first you get to uh, national liberation or democracy, and then you start implementing the second stage, which is the NDR. But the first stage, it requires really that those who are going to be implementing the NDR should have untrammeled power with very little prospect of ever being voted out of power, despite the fact that there is not notionally a democracy. And the ANC's big problem, particularly after the Soweto revolt, uh, which was sparked by black consciousness uh, organizations and the youth who so espoused them, they recognized that they were being eclipsed inside the country, that there were new black organizations coming up which had far more popular support than the ANC had, which had by then been banned since 1960. And the other great threat to the ANC, even more so than black consciousness, was the Encarta movement and Chief Bortolesi, who had successfully defeated the Grand Apartheid strategy by refusing to take independence for KwaZulu, who believed that liberation could come through nonviolent means, particularly the fact that there was growing labor power and consumer power within the black population, that this had never been used to the full. And uh, 
there were many people that supported the IFP's view, both in KwaZulu-Natal and, and also here on the reef. So Encarta was a formidable rival to the ANC, with far more popular support on the ground. The People's War strategy was um, developed in Vietnam, and uh, also very much with Soviet help. And the ANC sent a delegation there to Vietnam in 1978 to learn about People's War, the combination that you need of political struggles, things that people, I think, will remember, school boycotts, consumer boycotts, rent boycotts, stairways, strikes, um, and always propaganda, the most important part of the, of the political struggle. And at the same time, the program of violence, which is the accurate translation from Vietnamese, where the aim was partly to set off bombs and, and so create a, a sort of sense of ferment and advertise the ANC. But primarily it was to use terror to force people to take part in the protests, because much as people disliked apartheid and with good reason, they also were afraid of losing income or jobs if they took part in a stairway. So they needed to be frightened into doing so. And that was achieved by something like the necklace execution. And in the end, by the mere display of the symbols of the necklace, that an activist could walk up and down a, a queue where people were standing waiting for taxis and shake a box of matches. And that was a known symbol of the necklace and it would be enough to make people feel they wouldn't go to work that day. It was just too risky. So it was the violence that linked strength to the political struggles, which otherwise would have been quite small. And at the same time, it gave cover for attacking the ANC's main rivals, so black consciousness leaders, particularly from Asapo, and Encarta leaders and supporters were primarily the ones that came under attack, so much so that by the end of the People's War, uh, in Carter had lost 400 of its leaders and office bearers, many of them shot dead in premeditated ambushes, and thousands of its supporters. And because it had now successfully weakened its main rival, the ANC was, was able to win a convincing majority in the flawed and perhaps fraudulent 1994 election. But Having also so we weakened its main rival, it would be confident that South Africa would be a one-party dominant state, as it has been since 1994, in which there would be very little prospect of the ANC ever being voted out of power, and it would be able to proceed with the implementation of the NDO. And Anthea, many would argue that the ANC shifted to the centre in 1994 and even today emphasises investment and growth as well as economic transformation. So what is your response to this? That the ANC understands the importance of gathering resources and is very happy to do so from business. And it will always, as part of the propaganda campaign, uh, put out words, promises, undertakings which sound good which resonate with people's main hopes, which are, are growth and employment, investment to, to make both possible. But behind the scenes, the ANC is steadily implementing more and more laws that make it impossible for business to thrive. And the purpose of the NDR in a nutshell is first of all to, to cripple the capitalist economy so that more and more people end up being unemployed, for example, uh, they're being priced out of the labor market. Business is struggling too much to provide more jobs in any event. Um, at the same time, to expand the control of the government and dependency on the government. That's absolutely vital. Um, so that, for example, in the employment context, the now the ANC is trying to implement a program of permanent public employment, not just the expanded public works program that we've had for a while. But it's now arguing that the private sector cannot create jobs, therefore the state must do so. Um, and then, of course, the people who get public employment are dependent on the state. And at the end of the day, the plan is to de-link people entirely from the capitalist economy. So they, they depend entirely on the state. All housing comes from the state. All schooling comes from the state. There's no, no private housing available, no private schooling available. All healthcare comes from the state, which was why we now see the NHI and the attention for the state to take control of the private sector and healthcare. Every pension must come from the state. Not just the, no, we have the social grants, which are very important in, in alleviating poverty, but they're no substitute for earned income. Um, but the idea is that we must go much beyond that. 
that we must have a state pension, not private pensions, that in the end, the state will control transport as well, and also jobs. So the people depend on the state entirely for all their key needs. Uh, through the state's control of land, there will also be great control of food. Um, and this means that the state acquires a level of power, which is actually quite difficult to imagine in a still 70% or so capitalist society, because it is the main employer, it is the only landowner, it is the main landlord, uh, it is the, the only source of finance if you need money from a state bank. And it means that people who are dependent on the state also have very little challenge, possibility of challenging it politically. Uh, the only game in town becomes to be as close as possible to the ruling party. If you're closer to the ruling party, then you might be the one that gets access to health care when you need it badly. And normally the system would have you waiting two or three years to attain it. It, it boosts also the power of the ruling party, which will be really is the SACP. And it gives the people at the very top of the system not only at this extraordinary level of, of political power, but also a great deal of wealth, because they have now control over the resources of the country. They can direct how those resources should be used. And very often, and particularly in a world where we know that there's a great deal of corruption, those, many of those resources will be diverted into the back pockets of the ruling elite. And you will have, as in Venezuela, which has had now 23 years or so, 21st century socialism, You'll have the, the president, uh, it was Hugo Chavez, becoming one of the 400th richest people in the world. His daughter has four billion in US dollars, but most people in Venezuela are utterly impoverished. The economy has contracted by 70% in the last 10 years. There's an extraordinary degree of hunger. People, almost everybody is very poor, except for, for the elite. Seven million out of a population of 30 million have fled. And you know, the inequality between the suffering masses and, and the political elite at the top has widened enormously. And that's what socialism brings, whether you call it 21st century socialism or the sort of thing that we saw in the Soviet Union before 1991. And in your opinion, how is the ANC's cater deployment policy aimed at demographic representativity affected virtually every aspect of society and of the economy. The Cato deployment policy was one of the first NDR interventions because it provided a means of, of sidestepping checks and balances and executive power. Um, our constitution in many ways is good for the NDR, particularly the entrenchment of socioeconomic rights tended to empower the state. But it also says parliament has to hold the executive to account and the judiciary must strike down laws which are inconsistent with the constitution and the rule of law is supreme. And we have the chapter nine institutions which are supposed to support democracy. So one way of subverting them entirely is to deploy cadres to them who are appointed entirely for their loyalty to the ANC and to the NDR, not in any way because they're going to be answerable to the constitution and what it says. So that's the beginning of the process of white anting the constitution. And over time, you can weaken parliament in other ways, as has been done, and also the judiciary. And in terms of demographic representativity, that becomes a sort of slogan you can use to demand a pretty much a complete change in very many spheres. The underlying idea is that people in a society should fan out into every aspect of it in accordance with their share of the population. So in employment, uh, if the white population makes up 10%, then any workforce should also only be 10% white and it should be 80% black. And that, that you can apply the same idea to land ownership. You can apply the same idea um, in other contexts, for example, now in the water sphere. We've seen the government saying that those who, who are, are big irrigation farmers uh, must have 75% black ownership. The trouble with the demographic representativity idea, which has a sort of superficial appeal, and obviously it's, it's terribly important that all South Africans should have opportunities to get ahead in the economy. But the trouble with this rigid idea that you can work it out all in terms of percentages is that um, people are not the same. The, they have different experience, different interests, different aptitudes, 
Um, and so you've never found demographic representativity found in any society around the world. And yet the ANC pretends that it's a norm which has to be obtained. But the consequence too, because we had Bantu education and we haven't improved education since 1994, is that we're desperately shortage of the skills that are needed for people to move into high positions and do so successfully. And so we've we've seen a falling off of efficiency in the public service, which has vastly hurt the poorest people in the country who depend on the state to provide, whether it's housing or education or healthcare, that many of them don't have the option of relying on the private sector at the moment. And so the ultimate irony is that they're given the sort of promise of BEE and employment equity um, as a measure of redress for the past, but they have actually no chance of being appointed to management posts or in the BEE context, being the ones that get the deals or the ones that get the preferential tenders. So that these policies based on demographic representativity become what um, Thomas Sowell in the US um, has called a bait and switch strategy. You talk about the benefits to the poor as the bait. And then when the policy is in place, you switch all those benefits to the relative elite. And that's what's happened in South Africa, where a relatively small portion of the black population has been able to benefit from these policies. And the great majority have been harmed either by the inefficiency of the state or because these policies are so burdensome, so out of touch with reality that we've choked off investment, we've limited growth, we've reduced the scope for employment, and we've left millions unemployed. And as the SACP itself has acknowledged, BEE is the biggest reason why we have more inequality now than we did in 1994. It's because the black population obviously is the biggest. The great majority have actually become poorer on the whole. The small group has become much richer. So the gap between the poor and the rich has widened, but that's primarily looking within the black population. And it's just further evidence that BEE doesn't work for the majority and that we need a very different approach that doesn't try it for the, the sort of false goal of, of demographic representativity expressed in rigid quotas, but says we need growth and we need skills and we need opportunities for everybody, which will be far more effective. And tell us about your view on debates about South Africa's property clause in the country's constitution. Yes, sure. We have a, a property clause um, which protects property in the sense that it says that no property can be expropriated without just and equitable compensation and without striking an equitable balance between the interests of those who lose their property and the nation's interest in land reform. And that equitable balance is a particularly important requirement because, of course, there's a need to redress past wrongs, but the burden of doing so shouldn't fall solely on the shoulders of particular individuals, uh, landowners, other property owners. It's a societal problem. It should be met through the state, through the use of the state's resources. But it must, it, expropriation is also such a drastic measure that it should be used only as a last resort. And there are very many ways in which we could provide much more effective address than via expropriation. Um, and the government is now taking the view that expropriation without compensation is in keeping with the constitution, which I think is entirely not so. Uh, there'll be some who argue that it is. And the state is proceeding on that basis with the expropriation bill, which is now before parliament. One and one fears may soon be adopted, not only by the National Assembly, but also by the National Council of Provinces. Um, and just having the threat of EWC has been a major factor in South Africa's inability to attract investment, push up its growth rate, offer more jobs to people. Um, and as I said, the ANC claims that this is in keeping with the constitution on any uh, ordinary interpretation of the constitution, that is not so. So I expect there will be a considerable battle when the expropriation bill goes through, but how independent and fair-minded the courts will be, it's difficult to know. And what the ANC has also done to try and negate the role of the courts is introduce the land court bill. In other words, instead of having the ordinary courts of the country decide whether compensation should be nil, that task will be given to a new land court and um, it will be quite different from the courts in, in many ways. 
it'll be encouraged not to use the usual rules of evidence. So you might have quite a lot of evidence which is not particularly credible taking into account. And in addition, it will allow two lay assessors who don't have to have any particular independence or knowledge to be appointed. And those two assessors will be able to overrule a single presiding judge on all questions of fact including what the amount of compensation should be. So it's it's a very dangerous set of laws that are being put onto the statute book right now. Uh, these are the sort of sorts of things that in Venezuela um, have caused this extraordinary contraction of the economy. Similar measures in Zimbabwe had also disastrous effects there. Uh, whereas if we want to make sure that there is greater fairness, what we need is effective measures to expand the number of commercial farmers of all races and make sure they can all make success of their careers and help feed the nation. And lastly, Anthea, how do you think the calls for socialism can be defeated in the country's battle of ideas? Well, I think first of all is, is to make it, it, people need to know about the National Democratic Revolution. This is the drum to which the ANC has been marching for nearly 30 years. But the media seldom talk about it. And, and so even though the NDR is, is all over the ANC's public documents, most people don't have any knowledge. So first, be aware of what the ANC is trying to do and that it sees the NDR as the most direct route to socialism, often says that. And then if you don't want to live in a country like Venezuela, which most people don't, um, with this extraordinary level of poverty and inequality, then we have an opportunity in 2024 to vote the ANC out. And the numbers show the potential that there exists because in 2019, there were 10 million voters who voted for the ANC and 18 million voters who either stayed away from the polls or, or didn't even register at all. So those 18 million, far more than the number that voted for the ANC, might have thought they were punishing the ANC by staying away, might have had other reasons for doing so. But it's crucially important that all the voters who have stayed away in the past should go to the polls in 2024 and should vote for parties other than the ANC and their sort of lookalike parties, the EFF, I think, being the most dangerous of them. And in that way, we could put together a coalition of smaller parties that I think uh, have a common core of, of shared values um, that speak to many different constituencies too. And who are trying this very month, next week there'll be a national convention chaired by Professor William Gamedi, where the aim will be to set out all the rules and, and get the coalition parties to agree to stick to them and also to devise a set of, of constructive policies that will finally unleash the great potential of South Africa, reach right down to the grassroots and give people who are so marginalised and so poor in this situation the opportunity to take part in an expanding economy. That was Anthea Jeffrey speaking to Krima Media's Polity about Countdown to Socialism.